Here are a few clips of Helena Cronin and Simon Baron Cohen. That's Simon Baron Cohen. Booyakasha! Not Sasha Baron Cohen. Sasha is his cousin. These clips were taken from a debate on whether or not there are biological differences between men and women that influence the way they think and behave. A link to the full debate is in the description. A few of the points made here are put in interesting ways. If you watch the full debate, you can see how, once again, those who state that biological differences exist also openly acknowledge that social forces influence behavior. The social constructionist view is the extreme position, claiming that differences are only due to social forces, denying scientific research to the contrary, and constantly pushing for public policies based on this flawed logic. Ones who acknowledge that both biology and social forces are important note two things. The first is that very small differences in averages across populations can account for real differences in the real world. The second is that differences in individuals vary much, much more widely than in populations. This is how they can appreciate that statistical difference does not necessarily mean discrimination, while acknowledging that discrimination still exists. The social constructionists who deny differences in averages between males and females are often the same ones who point to large data set averages to conclude that this shows discrimination. It is difficult to see this as anything but intentionally dishonest, as one must deny valid research in order to justify a belief. Although these clips don't reference particular studies, Simon Baron Cohen's research is widely available. A video I posted a couple of weeks ago also shows several studies and articles supporting the topics discussed here. A link to that video is in the description as well. Beginning with the fact that I once heard a member of an all-girl street gang boasting about how macho their initiation ceremony was. Um, the two things they had to do was either get beaten up or have sex with a male gang. Now, sex as a penalty, imagine that for the male gang. It's just laughable. Over evolutionary time, mating has bestowed very different costs and benefits on males and females. And that's the key to understanding all sex differences. They've arisen from different selection pressures on the two sexes. Ultimately, those differences stem from different reproductive strategies. That was the very beginning of it. Sexual reproduction involves dividing your reproductive investment into two. After you uh, left cloning and you've got onto sexual reproduction in evolution, that's what you must do. You must divide your reproductive investment into two. You have to compete for mates and you have to care for offspring. Throughout the living world, males specialize more in caring, in competing, and females specialize more in caring. That doesn't mean that's the only things that they do. They specialize more in it. There's always that difference, some difference in the ratio. Consider, for example, the competitiveness. A quick way to think of it is, give a man 50 wives and he can have children galore. Give a woman 50 husbands, no advantage whatsoever. <laughs> so, disadvantage. <laughs> so, natural selection has strongly favored men who competed really strenuously for mates. And all men today are descended from victorious competitors. Thus, compared to women, men have always had far more to win, far more to lose, which makes them vastly more competitive. For example, risk-taking, single-minded, status-seeking, hierarchical, ambitious, opportunistic, entrepreneurial, and so on. More so in men than in women. Now, when mat natural selection shapes psychology, it also shapes bodies to match. So, looking at physical competition, the strength that's most crucial for physical competition, upper body strength, is 75% greater in males than in females. That really tells you something. And comparing male and female, matching the psychology and, and the bodies, stronger men are quickest to anger and feel most entitled to whatever they want. By contrast, anger and entitlement among females matches not strength, but, you've probably guessed, attractiveness. That's eloquent evidence of a different evolutionary past, precisely as predicted 
by Darwinian theory. Okay, but what about the claims about socialization? Um, boys, toys, guns, girls, pink frocks. No, natural selection doesn't build us to be putty in others' hands. Anyone who could be so readily manipulated about how to be a male or how to be a female successfully would never have become our ancestor. So, sex differences in mentality have been in the making for 800 million years. I'm asking whether biology, with yeah. its myriad pieces of tremendously useful wisdom, can helpfully inform an understanding of practical social issues, for example, to do with the sexism in female salaries, VAT on tampons, it's everywhere, you know? <laughs> I mean, how can biology take that further forward, I so, suppose? So, so my, my view is that if we want a society that is equal for the two sexes, that's more of a political mm. issue, and we, c we can change our so political system. So biology is not going to inform politics anytime soon? Well, I mean, they're separate enterprises that when we want to study the biology... And never the twain shall meet. <laughs> they, they, um, they need to meet. This is why we're having these debates. But I think that, um, first of all, it's very important to say that the research into sex differences really only tells you about group averages. And Gina made this point right at the beginning. It doesn't tell you anything about individuals. So at the boardroom or at the interview for the job, if you have a male or a female, you can't predict or presume anything about that individual based on their gender. And to do so would be stereotyping and discriminating. So biology but has very little to do with the real world, is what you're saying? No, because no? campaigns, sorry. Yeah. Please, please, Helen, let's <laughs> campaigns to get more women on board, the concept of the glass ceiling is all about averages. That's what it's about. Of course, the idea of when somebody comes to an interview, that's about individuals, so you shouldn't, look at, you shouldn't ask, are they male or female? If, y if it's meritocracy alone that you're concerned with, you might be concerned with whether they're male or female for other reasons. For example, you might be concerned about a jury in a rape case or something of that kind. These are very delicate, and very difficult questions. But certainly, if it's meritocracy that you're concerned with, then you shouldn't care whether it's a male or a female. You, you look at what their CV says, what their performance has been. But averages make a huge difference and unfortunately they are taken up wrongly in policy because people deny there are sex differences. Because they deny there are sex differences, they assume there's a glass ceiling preventing women from getting to the top and women are prevented from getting onto boards. Those are, both, those are both in general. Um, they assume that and say it must be discrimination. No, it's not discrimination. If you look at the real research on this, and if you look at the data, it's very clear that men and women have somewhat slightly different life priorities. There's, they're fairly slight differences, com particularly compared to some species, particularly of mammals, in which the males are hugely different, both literally and figuratively, from the females. We're not terribly different in lots of ways, but these life priorities make enough difference to get more men in the boardrooms, more men to the top, and for women to take jobs that are paid differently and to do it more often part-time, to stay at a lower level, willingly, willingly. That's what they actually prefer because their life priorities involve doing other things as Can well. Uh, we know that uh, in terms of reproductive system development, males and females clearly, d clearly differ. And the question is, what gives rise to those differences and do those factors influence our brain and our behavior? So um, for me, what's been really compelling in reading the scientific literature is that if you start at the point of conception and you look at the fetus, in the first four weeks of life, the fetus has no anatomic sex and no hormonal sex. A male and female fetus differs chromosomally uh, Gina's already mentioned about XX or XY. Um, but if you just looked at the anatomy of that fetus, you wouldn't see any difference. But the presence of that Y chromosome in males, and in particular a gene on that Y chromosome called SRY, triggers a whole cascade of um, developmental changes, in particular making the gonad, which starts off as what's called bipotential. It could go either way develop into a testes or an ovary. And cutting a long story short, the presence of the testes produces much more of a hormone called testosterone in males than in females. 
And the secretion of that hormone doesn't just change the fetus anatomically in terms of the reproductive system, but that hormone can also cross the blood-brain barrier and change the, the development of the brain and the development of behavior. So biology is playing a role. We'll come back to this. Um, uh, in animal research, um, you can manipulate the amount of that hormone, testosterone, to really show how it changes the development of the structure and functioning of the brain and postnatal behavior. But prenatal hormones, sex hormones like testosterone, and that's converted into estrogen, uh, really do play part of uh, the influence uh, on later behavior. Uh, what culture does and socialization does is equally important. So I want to underline that my position is an interactionist, I think very moderate position, that culture and biology interact, but we shouldn't lose sight of biology. Thank you. So I'll give you two examples where I think it matters. So I work in the field of autism, um, so it's a neurodevelopmental condition um, where people develop disabilities. And very interestingly, those children and adults who struggle to socialize and communicate, um, the majority of them are male. And one of the reasons that took me into the field of sex differences and gender differences was to try to understand why certain uh, clinics see far more boys than girls. Autism is one good example. A second example is language disabilities. Children who are late to talk, someone mentioned prisons. So uh, again, important areas of our society where we see very significant differences in the sex ratio of who ends up in those clinics or in those prisons. And the other example I was going to give was, uh, it's already been mentioned, about universities. What do you study at university? And when you look at the applications into subjects like mathematics, engineering, uh, computer science, physics, you see far more males applying for those subjects and being given offers to study those subjects than females. If you look at sciences like medicine, psychology, veterinary science, you see the opposite profile, far more female applicants and more offers uh, going to females. So to me, this is telling us that there are some interesting differences when you look at big data, large data sets across, for example, UK universities or uh, US universities, that the two sexes are equal in terms of scientific aptitude, but they're choosing to study very different sorts of things. That males are more likely, and these are just averages, more likely to apply to study sciences that are to do with inanimate objects or systems, and females are more likely to study sciences related to people uh, or to animals, animate sciences. So this may well reflect um, the, uh, I think what Helena called the values, the different values that um, we have uh, uh, been life, shaped life by. Life priorities. Life yes. priorities w that we've been shaped mm. by oh. for millions of years. So in a hundred years, men and women the differences between men and women won't have changed in the sense that they, they will still be the same evolved differences. But I hope that by then we will have a more considered, more informed understanding of what those differences are. And if we care about them turning out as differences in work, in education, in any sort of achievement that people want, we'll know how to go about it by starting with the fact that we're different and not pretending that we're the same. Pretending we're the same leads to disastrous policies, an attempt to, to get 50-50% everywhere, which is a most ludicrous policy because it's done in the name of trying to prevent, quotes, discrimination, because it's assumed that it would be 50-50 everywhere otherwise. It's not. And let's hope that by then policy will be informed by science. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a comment and hit that like button. If you didn't like it, please explain why. Open discussion is the only way to have a better understanding of differing views. Sharing this video on social media can help keep conversations alive. Now here are a few other videos that you may be interested in.